Hello everyone, Dave Landry here. Today is Thursday, March 16, 2016, and this is the week and charts. Thank you guys and girls for being here. I'm humbled by your presence. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what do we talk about? Well, I left some of this from last week and week before and month before and two months before. Are we in a current bull market? And I hate to label a market's action, but so far so good. And we'll flesh out that in a lot of details. Any questions you might have on trading? Um, while we're in the slides, keep them towards uh, the information on the slides if you don't mind, just because we have a lot to cover this week. Once we get to the live charts, if you want to ask about uh, individual stocks, feel free to do so. Uh, just do me a favor and ask about one at a time, and that's for your benefit, so I know where I co whether they're covered or not. Uh, my rooster is hanging out right outside of my door. Maybe my wife will hear him crowing and feed him something. <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit more on IPOs. And when we get to the live charts, I'm sure we'll talk a lot more on IPOs. I don't know if the mic's picking that up or not. but Anyway, and then I want to follow up on following a methodology, the hardest, easiest thing you'll ever do. And then this week's focus is... Many traders have got it all wrong. And there's good news on that, though. There's simple things you could do to avoid a lot of these mistakes. And that's going to make a lot more sense once we get into it. Before we do that, uh, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as often summing up, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, my apologies. i got to do a little housekeeping here before we get started. So let's just get this out of the way. Let's rip it off like a Band-Aid. Um, I, I have to get in front of this issue before it escalates any further. Um, it is true. Rachel Maddow did expose my methodology two nights ago. And um, there it is right there. So um, it is what it is. And, and that, that is my methodology. I'm not sure how she got it. I didn't give it to her. Maybe uh, Maybe she read my website. I don't know. All right, um, this slide's a little bit out of order, but let me go ahead and just cover it while it's here. Uh, this is Snap. Everybody and their brother is uh, talking about Snap. And, you know, one of my ongoing themes is don't confuse the issue with facts. And I just think it's a stupid IPO, and that's why you've seen me with my googly eyes and puking a rainbow so much in my recent columns. But the bottom line is, as I often preach, you want to, it's kind of like the Will Rogers approach when it comes to IPOs. If you didn't know anything about trading IPOs and you decide, hey, I'm going to start trading IPOs, then you really almost can just buy the ones that go up and avoid the ones that go down. And last week's show, we talked about a simple trading system. And if you look on my website, DaveLander.com, in last week's uh, blog, or whatever you want to call it. For some reason, I don't like the word blog, but it is what it is. I guess it's a blog. Um, I talked about a simple system about, about how to trade IPOs. And, and what I wanted to do is just show you that a simple system could work. And I think it could be fleshed out a little bit further. And obviously, we went into a lot more detail on a lot of these type of things in the IPO course. But as a general statement, and I used a five-day moving average just to force you to not be able to trade them until day six or further. And we do have one pattern that trades them, can trade them on day five. But you want to let them become public because a lot of times they come public with a lot of excitement, okay? This is a, another hyped IPO. And then the reality sets in sometimes really quick. And the market maker does a bad job or something. I don't know. Can you guys see that rooster? <laughs> but my wife's probably on the bike. Um, anyway, but you can see so far, Snap has failed miserably. Now, if you go back and look at last week's column and last week's webinar, all I said was two rules if you wanted to trade the system. Rule number one was, the low had to be above the five-day moving average, which meant you can't trade it for at least five days or 
on day six, I guess you could start trading it. And then the close had to be a new closing high. So in this particular case, the close would have to be up here. And obviously, neither one of these things have happened. And I wanted to publish this system, which I kind of thought about on the fly, FYI. But I wanted to publish it at the same time that Snap came public. So we'd have a nice, awesome live example. And so far, so good. Yeah, he's right outside my door looking at me. His name is Donald because he, his hair goes, or whatever, his feathers go straight out from his head. He looks a lot like Donald Trump. But anyway, I have a couple couple more things to point out on IPOs. That slide's a little out of order, but we'll get to the rest of the stuff in just one second. <laughs> okay. A couple of months ago, or was it a month ago, I guess, a month and change ago, on February 7th, I wanted to point out that the portfolio was on the cusp of going negative. And my point was that you should continue to follow your plan. And as you can see, it was pretty ugly in here. We had uh, quite a few losses. I can't find it. There it is. We had, uh, let's see, one, two, three. We had three out of five losing trades and really not much profit at all. And if you took out the close swing trade part, this would actually be negative. Well, my point was, let's just stay tuned and see what happens. And then here we have the portfolio as of yesterday. And if you've been following along uh, lately, and if you haven't, um, why not <laughs> go in and look at the uh, recent uh, uh, shows? And, and what I'm trying to show here is I just want to follow through these, these trades. Now, this one stopped out, I think, last week. And you can see it is at a loss, okay? But overall, the portfolio has improved greatly. So this is 2.7. Remember, we were at a $500 loss. And then as of last night, we're at about a $5,000 gain on a hypothetical 100,000K portfolio. So I just want to show you this and continue to follow along. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time picking it apart. Now, it doesn't always work this way, but hopefully this portfolio or I should say these trades, because, we, again, we're not going to follow the live portfolio every show because we do have some other stocks in the live portfolio now. And occasionally you might see me put it up. But I wanted to make the point that you want to follow the plan, and then any one of these stocks in here has the potential to turn into a huge winning trade. In fact, this one I think last week was actually a loser, and now it's um, so far, knock on wood, a decent winner. We'll come back to that one in a second, too. Now, this is what I want to talk about this week. And actually, I ran out of time. There's quite a few more posts that were part of this report that I wanted to talk about. But I simply ran out of time. So I, I picked the ones that I thought would make for the best examples. Uh, I, I do a uh, – I'm host of, a, of a, a weekly webinar. Now, I'm not host every week. I used to be, but it became a little bit too hard to keep up with, with all I have going on. So now I'm sort of a guest host that I come just I kind of pitch it, fill in when um, the other hosts aren't available. But it's for timing research, and it's a pretty good little show. You'll you'll probably get an email maybe once once a month or so whenever I'm host, and I'd recommend you attend live because it's uh, we we get a few guys on there, and it's always kind of interesting to um, to talk with these guys, and usually I learn something too. But there's always a question of the week, and usually, um, at least when I'm host, I have a hand in that question. But this week, uh, I didn't know what the question would be until I actually printed the report five minutes before the show. And the question was, what is your best piece of advice for trade management? It was kind of interesting because this dovetailed right in nicely with a recent column I wrote about the check your checklist for trading. In fact, if you go to my home page right now, and I'll see if I can pull it up in the background. But if you go to my home page, on the home page there's that checklist, and, and I think it's a very important um, checklist for you as a trader. So I just thought it was kind of interesting. The timing was pretty cool. And it's almost it looks like I actually had something to do with the um, 
with the question. But if right on my homepage, right here, your trading checklist. And if you're watching this show in a few months from now, just click right here and you can find it. But um, it's a pretty good column, I'll say so myself. I've gotten quite a few uh, comments on it. So thank you guys so much. Anyway, now before we start talking about some of these answers to, these que to this question, I thought it was kind of interesting, or it, it reminded me of the column that I wrote not that long ago based on what uh, Lord, his, what's his name, Lord Tyron, Tyron, King Tyron, Lord Tyron, whatever his name is from uh, Game of Thrones. I'm probably the last person on the universe to watch Game of Thrones. But in one episode, he said, a wise king knows what he knows and what he doesn't. And I thought a pretty good corollary to that would be a wise trader knows what he knows and knows what he doesn't. Now, I was inspired by these quotes or to put these quotes in here because it seems like some of these people were influenced, or their answers, I should say, were influenced by conventional wisdom and by other things where, in theory, theory and practice are the same, and in practice they are not. And that's going to make a lot more sense as we get into it. But just to get one more quote out of the way, it's not what you know, it's what you know that isn't so when it comes to, to getting you in trouble. So the point I'm trying to make here is that I think a lot of these people think they're doing the right thing, but I was amazed at the responses. And now true, and I'm, I'm going to kind of, you know, backpedal a little bit towards the end of this presentation, but true, some of the stuff may have been taken out of context, but I have to go off face value because that's their exact answers. And you can actually get these, uh, you can actually get this report. It's the 312 50, uh, 17 report off of Timing Research's website. Now, one of the answers was, and let me let me find the question for you. Uh, the question was, what was your best advice? Oh, there it is right there. If we go back one slide. So the question was, what is your best piece of advice for trade management? Now, let's go back to the the first answer. Now remember, the question was, what is your best piece of advice for trade management? And one of the answers was, stops kill. Now, I hear you because let's say you're trading a reversion to the mean system and you buy here and you put a stop in here. Well, what will happen, more likely than not, is you will get stopped out. And then, of course, the market will turn right back around. So you don't want to use a stop. Well, the only problem with that is that'll work until it don't. Now, if you go back and read that column that I wrote a couple of weeks back on my website, you can see we got it to Nova, and this was an example that I used when I was in Traders Expo recently. And you can see we had a buy signal and a pullback, and then we trailed the stop higher, we took some partial profits, and then we got stopped out. So what? Okay. IPOs are great for trading. Okay. Well, somebody in the audience pointed out, because I was just showing the, the before setups and saying, hey, check out these great setups. You think you could have recognized them? And they all had big blue arrows on the charts and nice obvious trends and obvious pullbacks. And that's the point I was trying to make is it doesn't have to be that complicated. You don't have to plot 15 oscillators and Fibonacci and the counting of the waves and all this other stuff. Just ask yourself, is the chart obviously, is the market obviously headed higher and has it pulled back and is it set up and does it trade cleanly and all those other things that I talk about quite often. And that was my whole point learn to recognize very simple patterns first and trade them and then maybe venture out a little further. But the bottom line is you do still want to keep it simple. And anyway, somebody pointed out that, hey, you know what, Dave, didn't that stock implode? Didn't it lose like 
75% of the value recently? I'm like, yeah, it sure did. Now, I can't guarantee we'll always get stopped out right before this happened, but as you can see, we did. So if you get into a trade like this, especially if you're a very short-term trader, you're not allowing yourself to make longer-term gains, and you get a 75% hit overnight, depending on how much you put into your into this trade, you're going to be a hurt and pop. I was at a conference a while back, and some of these day traders, some of these gunslingers out there, they're putting uh, their margin in their account 200% into one stock and if something bad happens then they're in a world of hurt and, and one of the guys was saying that uh, some guy got killed and what was that KBIO or something and he actually put up a GoFundMe account to try to <laughs> to try to claw his way out poor poor guy so yeah that'll work until it don't not using stops obviously now somebody wrote look for infrastructure to start happening well my problem with that, as we talked about way back in November when uh, Trump won the election, is to beware of big picture ideas. They never seem to to play out like they normally do. I don't want to beat the dead horse in this because we talked about it so much uh, back late last year. But the point I was making, or the main point, was that remember the gun stocks under Obama? Gun stocks under Obama went up like 900%. And he was the most anti-gun president in history. How'd that get in there? <laughs> I used to have a friend that was a, um, he was a friend of a friend. He was a DYN and, and very respected doctor and, and um, just loved dearly and all. And on the weekends, he would play a red deck. It was just the funniest thing. And, and we would actually, we'd buy him gifts like we'd buy him a hat with a ponytail that hang, hang out the back or we'd get him a shirt with the sleeves cut off and stuff. Like he'd wear it on the weekends. It was funny as heck. And uh, I kind of play, I, I do play the role of a red deck on the weekends, which is, it's, it's kind of fun. If you've never done it, I suggest do it. I don't, I don't watch NASCAR, but I have a NASCAR jacket. <laughs> I had a, an acquaintance come by my office once, one time for some reason. He kept looking at my bookshelf. I'm like, what is he looking at? He kept looking over my head towards my bookshelf. And he thought, uh, he saw the picture of me on a book, and he goes, is that really you? And I was like, yeah. He goes, you wrote a book? I said, yeah, I wrote three. And he was like, oh, I thought it was like in the mall. You go down there, and they put your face on the cover of a magazine or something. So anyway, I don't didn't mean to digress that far. I just thought it was funny. Now, somebody else said, buy low and sell high. Wrong. As I often preach, it's often darkest right before it gets more dark. And if you go back a few years, I did a column where I showed the NASDAQ, and it was down 67%. That seems like a good buy. It was pretty dark, right? Well, it got even more dark from there. It went down to almost 80% after that. So be really careful about buy low, sell high, because, again, it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. Don't lose money. Well, that's kind of interesting. The only way to ever make money on a trade is to put capital, is to put money into harm's way. So there's no, there's no way to ever not lose money if you're going to be a trader. Now, that's where a lot of people get into trouble is they trade with money they can't afford to lose. Or in the case of some of my more wealthier clients, they fund account with a small amount of money and they don't, proper, they don't practice proper money management. So either they need the money and shouldn't be trading it, or they're not viewing the money as for trading. And just, I don't want to digress too far on this. I know I talked about being a redneck now, but <laughs> too late, huh? But you got to realize that some of these people will look at these accounts, and when, they, when they're up big on a trade, they'll lock it in. They'll lock in, let's say, 100% gain because, hey, you know what? They could pay up a credit card or pay a mortgage payment, or they monetize that money. 
into something that they can do with that money as opposed to letting it continue to grow. And then on the flip side, let's say they've got a stop in place and the market starts going against them and they're down 1.75% and they think, oh, you know what? I don't feel like losing 2% total in this trade. I'm just going to cash out. And guess what happens? The market stops short of their stop, turns around and goes right back up. So you have to realize you're going to have losses and losses are part of the game. Make sure the money you put aside is for trading. And I think I covered this in a lot of detail in the 17, uh, was it 17 resolutions for 2017. Do you drive a pickup truck with a gun rack? No, I don't have a pickup truck, though. Nothing, nothing over the top redneck. I live in the country, so you have to have a, a truck if you live in the country. Now, somebody said neutral tactics for now, short the S&P 500. And then there were plenty more bearish things out there. And my question is, which way is the market headed? It doesn't take a rocket surgeon to know that the market is headed what? Up. Okay. Now, somebody says, tracks your trading performance in real time. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but you'll find that the more observations you make, and again, I've written extensively on this too and talked about it quite a bit in these webinars, the more observations you make, the more likely you're going to put yourself into a state of regret. And the example was a great example. As I was writing about it, we had a position that went up 20% in one day. And as I continued to write, it dropped about 5% right in front of my eyes. And I immediately felt kind of like a loser. I just lost 5%. But I was still up 15%, okay? Or how, however the math works out. But you know what I'm saying. Had I just looked at it at the end of the day, I would have said, oh, yeah, it was higher during the day. But, hey, I made 15%. That's good. So that would have been a positive observation as opposed to a positive followed by a negative, followed by a negative, followed by a negative observation during the day. So I would recommend you be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. And I used to find, I used to have my portfolio spreadsheet tied into a quote feed, and I always had a live um, quotes going straight to my spreadsheet. And obviously, when you log your brokerage account, you can see your account, see what's happening. But I would encourage you not to watch that too much. And I know I'm guilty as charged. I mean, sometimes I'll punch in the numbers in the spreadsheet or log in, see what's going on. If, I'm, if it logs me out, I'll log back in, see what's going on. I keep a Forex um, screen up all the time, and I probably look at that too much, okay? But only look at it if you think there's something that needs to be done. Now, somebody said they're worried about the Dodgy Friday. I think they meant Doji. And what I would say to that is, and this is what I was talking about in my service a couple nights ago, channeling yoga, one bar does not a market make. And I'll give you an example. This was from my trading service. This is a stock, and I've noticed I put the candles, because I find the candle people, my only problem, my main problem with them is it's always a pattern. And a lot of times it's just a little one bar pattern. And then a couple days ago in SALT, and this is one more long, as you saw in the portfolio a minute ago, a couple days ago it made an outside day down, which even on a Western chart is slightly bearish. But it's a, in candle speak, it's a fat sumo squishing a baby sitting on a window. You had a window here, and I guess this is the baby, the fat sumo here. And, you know, knock on wood, so far the stock is going on to make new highs. Here's my problem, or one of my problems. Yes, a one bar pattern might be the end of a trend. But many times a one bar pattern is not. And if you look at some of these books where they show these one bar patterns, like they make it look so simple, like, oh, you just got to look for a fat sumo and squish you to baby on a window. And then that's going to be the end of the trend. Then they show this beautiful trend that goes down. Well, what they don't show you is all the other fat sumos and all the other three birds crapping on a wire, and all these other patterns that occurred 
where the market did absolutely nothing as far as reversing is concerned. It actually went on to make new highs. So what I would urge you to do if you are going to study such a method that could go off of a one or two bar pattern or even a three bar pattern, make sure you fully understand the pattern and make sure that you play devil's advocate. Play devil's advocate with anything I tell you too. You know, if I give you a little system or talk about a methodology or a setup or something, go in and find the ones that work. But more importantly, find some that don't work, okay? Find 100 examples before you make your first trade over a long period of time. Now, some of the stuff I showed recently, especially like that little moving average system, has worked out really well. If we have time, we get to the charts, we'll flip through a few and I'll show you. But keep in mind, oh, I'm proud of the system, don't get me wrong, or the, the setup, whatever you want to call it. I'm proud of it. but We've been in this nice, nice bull market in IPOs for a few years, so that helps. And in more recent times, we've been in a bona fide bull leg overall, so that helps too. So make sure you take it within context. Make sure you study it and look to pick it apart. Now, somebody wrote, sell a credit spread, 2345-2340. Well, one thing I would urge you to do with options is to not trade options, okay, before we pick this apart. If you have dedicated a big part of your life towards trading options and you have studied them inside and out and you understand that there's a lot of moving parts, then by all means, knock yourself out. I'm very good friends with Larry McMillan. He trades options, obviously. He wrote the book on options, literally. And he knows what he's doing. And he has a money management firm. And his money management firm is doing very well. Well, most of us, certainly me, <laughs> I ain't Larry, Larry McMillan, <laughs> okay? So make sure you really, really, really understand what you're doing. Now, one thing that I found kind of interesting is two things actually first of all if you're selling a credit spread that's a bearish setup right well the question I have is why would you sell a bearish thing during a bull market now just for S and G's I wanted to get my math right on some of this so it's been a while since I've done any spreading, many years. I, I did spend 14 years in a fund that traded options, so I learned a little bit through osmosis. And by the way, I don't want to digress too far. The problem with options is you have to get direction right, and you have to get timing right, and then you have to get magnitude right. How far will the market go? How long would it take it to get there? And which direction will it head, obviously? And... They would always ask me, well, what do you think? I said, well, it's going higher. Okay, how high will it go? I don't know. It's, I'm a trend follower. It's, it's going higher. Okay, well, how long is it going to take it to get to this level? I don't know. I bet it looks like it's on its way to that level, but I can't tell you when. So you got to be really good. And it's hard enough, at least for me, to get direction right. So just for SGs, I, I, I was doing a little Googling this morning, and I found a website that was – way oversimplifying our options. And they had a hypothetical example. Now, it's a hypothetical example. What even a real market example. So they could have made up anything they wanted. And it was kind of cool that in their example, they were risking $10 on a credit spread to make one. And this is where it really kind of made me chuckle. It said, all you need to do is wait for the option to expire a month later, and you get to keep the money. It's like, really? <laughs> well, provided, of course, it works, and you don't lose the full $10 after risking $1. As I often say, things like reversion to the mean and selling options will work until they don't. And it's a great way to have a very brilliant but very brief career on Wall Street. Now, again, maybe there's a reason why this person might be saying this, and maybe it's out of context of something bigger that they're doing, but I have to take it at face value. And they said, 
never buy or sell all at once. Unless there are special individual circumstances, buy and sell in scales because it will always go up or down after your transaction. My problem with that is that you're increasing your chances of regret. Now, again, I, I don't know what they're doing, but if you're framing it within my methodology, we're looking to play that bounce from oversold in a pullback for an, an emerging for an existing trend. If we're an emerging trend, we're looking to time it just right so that market begins to fly off the lows or implode from the highs. So, and it doesn't happen all the time, but every now and then we get it just right and the markets just take off. So you're going, you're going to increase your chances of regret because you're only going to have half a position on, or if you're scaling it, maybe a third of a position on. And then you got to watch the market take off without you. So now what do you do? Do you buy even though it's higher? Do you wait for it to come back in? So I think it's a bad idea, framed again within my methodology. And the other thing you're doing is you're increasing your your stress because you're increasing the number of decisions. Now, remember, every time you make a decision, as I often preach, it's going to have emotions and stress involved. If you just decide to get into a market full position, as I believe in, and again, it's not my way or highway, as I often preach, but if you decide just to get in the market with a full position, then you're in the market. You made one decision and you're done, okay? But if you decide to scale in, do you scale in even though the market's higher? Do you scale in even though the market's lower? Is it a bargain then, okay? Or do you not do nothing and do you wait a little longer? And as you can see, this tree grows, this decision tree grows, I don't know if geometrically or exponentially, or if they're both, same, both the same thing, but let's just say exponentially, really fast. And you can see one decision can become three different decisions that you have to make, and then that can, can grow from there. So I think it can really vastly increase the chances of putting yourself into a state of regret. Because if that market takes off without you, you're going to have a small position. If you start loading up because it becomes a bargain after you get in and then that market implodes, assuming you're going long, then once again, you're in a state of regret. So you have to avoid putting yourself into these, these potential negative consequences from the start. Now, this looks like another bearish person. Why would you want to sell calls, buy puts, buy contras? I don't know if that I don't even know what a contra is. Uh, I guess go opposite of the market. Oh, probably like inverse ETFs, I suppose. Short stocks and go to cash or treasuries. Now, you might be right once in your whole career about a top. And, and let's truth be told, there's been some, some guys out there that were right once 30-something years ago, and they have launched an entire career from that. Now, they haven't made any money trading in 30-something years, but they called that one top. And everybody put them on a pedestal, and they sold a bunch of books because they call it one top. <laughs> okay? I don't want to be here hypocritical. I, I make money in my educational business. I'm not ashamed of that. But I'm making calls every week, okay? And I practice what I preach. And I'm not trying to look like a guru and look smart. So why would you cash out of the market and go short when it's at or near new highs? So to that, I'm like, hmm? F looking smart is what I say. And that's how I became a trend following moron. Now, early in my public career, even though I was a trend follower, I found myself in putting out commentary every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. I was trying to predict every zig and zag, and it began to really wear on me. And then it just 
had an epiphany one night. Dave, your trend follower, just keep following the trend. Don't fight it and err on the side of longer term trend. My life got a lot better. And that's when I started drawing the arrows on the chart, uptrend, downtrend, and sideways sometimes. And that's when I pretty much got told to stick the arrows when the sun doesn't shine because someone was very, very, very long a market. And I guess I'll have to tell a full story someday. It's a two-drink minimum right now for that story. But anyway, they were very, very, very long a market. I'm sorry. They were very, very, very short a market. Very like this aforementioned gentleman, even though the market was going up. And I kept drawing arrows in my column every day. And they called me a trend-following moron. And I was very upset about that and really got bummed out. And then it's like, you know what? What's the old saying? Wear that shit like a badge. You know, take that criticism, run with it. Maybe I am a trend-following moron. And that's kept me from fighting the trend. So I want to thank him for doing that. And then the other thing the aforementioned gentleman said, assuming he's a gentleman, um, he said, tighten the stops up. Well, you don't want to tighten your stops up unnecessarily. If the market's moving to your favor, if the market goes up, let's say, five points, and then your, your system says, well, I'm going to tighten my stops five points because the market went up, that's fine. But don't tighten your stops just because the market is high because you don't know how high is high, okay? Uh, back in 2000, late 1999, 2000, everybody thought the NASDAQ was high and it went a lot higher, okay? And that goes for any bubbles throughout history. So using my own example here, again, I have to frame it within what I do because I don't know what they're doing. But we go back to the original example that we've been following along with since November. We barely had a gain in the portfolio. We had three losing trades. Remember, each one's a half a position, okay? They're put on 100% at once, okay? Let's say this is 1,000 shares. One of these is 1,000 shares, but let's say it's 1,000 shares. Well, you put them all on at once and then divide them into two when you track them. And this is to make it easy because this is the swing trading part and this is hopefully the longer term trend following part. But as you can see, this was pretty uncertain. Had we tightened stops, we would have zero here or maybe even locked in a loss instead of these big gains. And look at this. This right here, I'm not going wood, as of last night, $3,000 gain on a... 100K or per 100K, I should say. That's nothing to sneeze at. That's a 3% gain overall. Okay. You do that in a few positions, and after a while, it begins to add up. But you can see it really wasn't that impressive that long ago. So the thing to do always is just follow your plan. And one thing that I often preach, and you'll see it throughout these slides. I know I beat the dead horse a lot. But I'm going to keep beating the dead horse until you people get it. <laughs> Not you people. I know you get it. But the thing that I often say is that there's always a reason to exit a trade. Let me repeat that. Let me repeat that. <laughs> there's always a reason to exit a trade and rarely a reason to stay. No, lighten up, lighten up the position is not taking partial profits. Lighten up the positions in my methodology is you have a specific goal in mind and you're taking partial profits at that specific goal. Easy for me to say, specific goal. So, again, you know how I think most everybody here knows what we're doing, so let me just kind of rush through it. So you got an entry. Let's say you have an initial profit target here and you got a trailing stop. We're going to lighten up here because we've achieved our goal. We're not going to be in trend-following mode and then lighten up. Okay, along the way. And then I don't know if I slide further in or not, but uh, recently these Forex companies go out of business once once every two months or whatever. The one account that I have has been transferred. This is like a third or fourth time it's been transferred since I've owned it. But long story endless, it's like my positions got transferred over. I had three positions that got transferred over. And one 
pretty much became a winner fairly quickly in the new account, and two became losers, okay? And on two of those, like the stop was here. Let's just make them, they were shorts, but let me just make them longs, make it easy. On two of those, stops like right here, and it's getting really close, okay? And I'm sitting there watching it going like, man, that sucks. I should just bail out. Well, guess what? Both of them returned or reversed sharply. And had I lightened up in the face of uncertainty, and guess what? There was a Fed decision looming, okay? I would have lost a lot of money. Now, so what if I lose this much more body on the position to stop out? What did I say a few minutes ago? The only way we can get paid is to put capital in the harm's way. And it's a trading account, okay? I've known other writers who money consistent. You talk about option writers, but give it all back in one day. Okay, good. Howard, I'm glad you said that. Okay. I have literally seen things work for 20 years. Okay. My hand to God. I've seen things work for 20 years and then blow up. Okay. So as long as you quit 19 years, 51 weeks in, you'd have, pretty, you'd have been pretty impressive. Okay. But yeah, there are, yeah, I mean, it's tough. And and the problem with the option selling is it, it it looks like this this perpetual money machine. And it's very easy to sell such a system to people and make a lot of money selling that system. But the rest of the story, what they don't tell you is many times I blow up. Now, there's a few things to be gleaned from this. If you try to interject logic, and there's various forms of logic that kind of make a lot of sense. Buy low, sell high, buy infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure stocks because the president uh, claims he's going to do something with infrastructure. But never forget that markets are irrational. And I'm going to make your life a lot easier. Is the market going up? Is the market going down? And is the market going side? Or is the market going sideways? Never forget. Now go ahead and plot your 15 oscillators and count your waves and do your Fibonacci and your numerology counting of the one bar, two bar. No, it's a three bar. It's an inside bar. You don't count that bar. Inside bar, outside bar. Blah blah blah. Do that if you must. But always ask yourself. Is it going up, down, or sideways? Now, I'm going to digress for a second. Imagine that. I've seen, I was having a conversation with, um, I think it was Phil earlier this week. I've seen some amazing things happen, okay, using some of these arcade methods. But Dave, I thought you were against those arcade methods. No, 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 no. Hear me out. Let me finish. I've seen some amazing things happen, but... It's in the direction of the trend. So I've seen some people, and there's one in particular, print a, f a lot of money in a downtrend following an arcane method. But guess what? The market did this. Okay? Now, at this point here, I'm sorry, the market started going up. Okay? And at this point here, the arcane method said that it was due for a huge fall. And then as it went up further, it says it's still due. It's even more due here for a huge fall. And then at this point here, it's like it's even even more due for a huge fall. Well, the arcane method worked incredibly well here. Why? Because it was in sync with the trend. And then when the trend began to reverse, it kept reversing. It just said you should load up and, and short even more. And I've seen this happen quite a few times. I know it made it sound like it's one in particular. It's just one pops into my head. But the more I think about it, I've seen it happen quite a bit. Conventional wisdom is often wrong. I think I kind of beat the dead horse on that. Uh, it might sound good on paper, but the map is not the territory. Okay? Uh, say you are selling options, for instance, and you mapped it all out, and you looked at it for years, mapping it all out. Everything looks pretty good. You go to do that, okay? And things kind of blow up on you, but it's totally in line with what you mapped out. Unfortunately, you didn't factor in 
that they might raise margins on you or some sort of world crisis might happen and margins might get raised and you might have to liquidate your account. But if you'd have held an extra few days, everything would have been just fine. Okay. So be really, really careful. You have to play devil's advocate and always make sure that you're risking a lot less than what you can make. And that aforementioned, um, hopefully I made the point good enough, but they were risking 10 to 1, okay? And guess what? Probably 9 out of 10 times it'll work. It's that 10th time that'll kill you. They're risking $10 to make $1, and that's in their hypothetical example. That's not even a real market example, which usually is going to be worse. One thing I can guarantee out of the few things that I can guarantee legally or ethically is that you will get whacked on a trade. We've all been there, done that, and have the t-shirt. If you haven't, I'm sorry, it's going to happen to you sooner or later. So you have to make sure that your gains are somewhat limited. And I use the word somewhat because something bad can still happen even if you have a stop. Obviously, you can gap against you, okay? I showed that trade earlier. Luckily, we got stopped out long before the gap. As a general statement, surprises do tend to happen in the direction of the trend. So that's a good thing. When that trend begins to reverse and that new trend begins to emerge, not all the time, but quite often, you will get stopped out before the shit hits a fan. Okay. So you have to make sure that you have somewhat limited losses while still allowing for unlimited gains. You have to make as much money as possible and, and pardon my French you ladies out there but you have to be a greedy bastard it's never enough on a trade you have to make as much as you can because you will get whacked on occasion don't feel guilty because you're up 200 percent on a trade maybe it'll go up 400 percent maybe it'll go up a thousand percent okay doesn't happen every day but you'll never capture those big gains unless you play to win and play to win big and then obviously Make sure you lose small. You know, screw looking smart. A reoccurring theme that I've seen in this list of these answers is a lot of these people are trying to look smart and outsmart the market. Okay, it's not easy giving up your ego and allowing yourself to be called a trend following moron and follow along the market. Yes, one of these times they're going to be right, but who cares? Okay, and you will be wrong that one time. I would rather make money than be right and or look smart. Now, again, maybe I'm taking some of this stuff out of context, okay? And then I, I didn't have enough time to put it in the slides, but it's it's stuff that I preach every week, so you know it. Like somebody said, risk only 2% per trade, amen, and a lot of other things like that were in there. So some people did get it right, but a lot of people or most people, and I hate to say in my opinion because if I'm talking, it's my opinion, right? I hate when people say that. In my opinion, it's like, well, um, you know, can, do you give opinions for others? Yeah. But in my humble opinion, most of them, I think, have got it, got it wrong. Now, let's see what you guys are talking about here. Sorry about that. No problem. Me looking smart, Craig. Yeah, Craig's a fellow, fellow TFM. I love that. You know, it's like I get the emails from people. Hey, Dave, fellow TFM here. Okay, let's clean this up real quick. That pattern description is crazy complicated for nothing. Which one, Elvis? I should have, um, I forget which slide that was on. You talk about the, the sumo wrestler sitting on the baby, sitting on the window? Candlestick, yeah. Okay, IPOs. Oh, you know what? Maybe I had it flipped around. Maybe that's what my confusion is. Uh, somebody said that that credit, usually sell the credit spread is a bearish thing. Did I have that flipped around because of the the inside strike and the outside strike? 
Well, either way, it's it's a it's a it's not a um, it's still a dangerous thing to do selling spreads, unless you fully understand what you're doing and you have a damage control play thing in place. A um, couple of things I want to follow up on with the initial public offerings. Um, last week, as I said, they're from trading, okay, and so they might not be any substance behind it, but if Snap began to take off and look pretty good as a setup, even though it's the stupidest stock in stupid town, in my opinion, then I would trade it. And it's our job to make money. So IPOs can be a wonderful trading vehicle. I added one thing in from last week. Three things you need to do. Let them establish themselves first. I'm getting a lot of emails from people, I guess because I've been talking about IPOs so much and IPOs are in vogue. But I'm getting a lot of emails from people like, hey, Dave, how can I find these issues before they come public? And the answer to that question is, uh, is uh, Hoover's IPO Central, somewhere on Hoover's website. That's where I did a lot of research years and years ago on IPOs because you can get the historical IPOs where they come public and all. And NASDAQ.com in more recent times. Uh, the problem is a lot of times they never come public or the dates are delayed or whatever, so you don't sit around and wait for them. But even if you did sit around and wait for them, make sure you let them establish themselves first. And that's why I thought it'd be kind of fun to put, uh, all right, you showed selling us calls, credit spread, which is a bearish play. Yeah, somebody said that was bullish. I, I thought it was bearish. But you see how you see how confusing these op options can get, you know. And, it, and I was hesitant to even put that in these slides because I'm thinking that's bearish, right? Okay, but either way, it's it's a lot of moving parts. So, Again, getting back to the IPOs, you want to let them establish themselves first, and that's why I thought it'd be kind of a fun way to have a hard and fast rule that wait until they are trading above, in other words, daylight, their five-day moving average, because that would keep you out of the issue until day six, okay? And again, in the course, the IPO course, our first pattern can only trigger at the end of day five. So we have to wait five full trading days, okay, less one minute before the close, before we'll even take a look at an IPO. Now again, this is where now this is where one of those conventional wisdoms or whatever you want to call it does make sense. Only buy the ones that go up. If they don't buy them, if they don't go up, don't buy them. And then of course have a chair ready for when the music stops or as we talked about last week, when the sardine begins to stink. Huh. Craig says, I'm too stupid for options. Well, no, not necessarily. You're smart for not trading them. And number two, most brokers list IPOs. Okay, good uh, good point. Okay. A couple of announcements, and I, I want to show you one more thing with IPOs before we uh, hop into the chart. Well, once we hop into the charts. I'm still rolling out the learning management system. It's just taking me a while. It's like I spend a day doing this show. I spend a day doing column. I spend a day doing stuff for other people. Um, it's just not enough time in a day. At some point, the beginner's course is going to be part of that. And I've got a few beta testers, uh, which I appreciate, guys, for you guys helping with that. And you've been a tremendous help on getting that rolled out. Um, I'm hoping, you know, it's kind of like um, – when I was rolling out something a while back, and I talked to a friend of mine doing the same thing, it's like, uh, what was the movie where every time they asked the contractor how long, it's like two weeks, two weeks. So hopefully two weeks I'll start rolling it out. But I'm pretty proud of this um, beginner's course. I'm very proud of it. And like everything I do, it's like I find myself just putting more and more and more and more into it. So it's, it's a little bit more than a beginner's course. In fact, it's probably 90% of everything I do is in this course. The rest is just some details, stuff like the stock selection. But for the most part, everything's pretty much in there. One thing I encourage you to do is get on the delayed service if you're not already on it. If you go to getting started on my website, and then if you're watching this, um, the website will change up a little bit over time. So if you're watching this historically, a year from now, whatever, um, poke around my website a little bit. Now, somebody emailed me, he's like, Dave, you haven't updated it in a while. And the reason is because we have an IPO set up, and with IPOs, I'm a little more lenient. 
and let's say the trigger's here, and it's just been going like this for a while, and it has it triggered. So I don't show live setups in a delayed service out of courtesy to my clients, okay? And that's why on my home page, where I currently have the delayed service posted often, or I usually show a week old service, it's uh, we have a live trade that's still possible. That's why I'm not showing it. But get a delayed service. There is a limit to the amount of people. If you're a special situation where you don't have a lot of money or a student or something, let me know and I'll make room for you. But um, if you can afford to trade and you can't decide after a year, then good decisions make the how do I say that? Good traders make good decisions. If you can't decide in a year, then trading's probably not for you. Got any questions, shoot me an email. And then obviously a lot of free stuff on my website. Now to the live charts, I want to show you before we get into um, the live charts. There's a simple trick to finding new issues, and I've been I've gotten probably a half a dozen emails on this over the week, last week or so. What you do is you just run a formula that requires X days to calculate. Okay? Close minus close 100. Okay? And TC, I think it looks something like this, or is it C.100 or something? You get the idea. Or I think I used to use a moving average, close minus 100 day moving average, or something like that. And that's going to give you every one with 100 days or less. So anything rejected, and I'll show you how to do that in one second with fewer than X days is a new er, issues, whatever X day is. Now, if you want to go in and look at the, the IPOs of the last couple of years, then put in 500. That'll give you roughly two years worth of IPOs. So let me just show you how to do that real quick in the charts, and then we'll hop into the charts. Now, if you guys want to start asking about uh, individual issues, feel free to do so now while I get this set up. And remember, one stock per line, if you don't mind, that's for your benefit. If not, um, there's a chance that I might not be able, I might not get to each one you're asking. Or worse, we'll end up covering them twice, and I'll just aggravate everybody. Okay, let's do this. What's the problem here? Oh, I know what to do. It's funny, I zip around this all day long, and when I'm uh, in a live webinar, it's a little harder. Okay, yeah, keep those questions covered, too. Keep the stock picks coming. I'll, I'll get to those. Let me just show you how to do this IPO thing before I forget. Okay, first thing you want to do is you want to look at all stocks. Now, keep in mind, this is in Telechart, and this is in the old version, but I'm pretty sure the same sort of logic and reasoning will work with any other software package. Um, I haven't tried it in Metastock, but I would imagine it would work in Metastock too because don't you get like a rejected pile? And that's what we're look, going to look at. We're going to look at the rejected pile. So you could sort them by a simple PCF. For instance, you see right here I got closed minus 100. Let's sort them by that, and then let's, let's edit that PCF. Let me show you what's in that PCF. PCF is personal criteria formula. So really, really simple. C minus C100. That's it. Okay. That's going to take today's close minus a close of 100 days ago. Okay. I don't care what that comes out to. It's just a bogus formula. Okay. That takes 100 days. You could use a moving average or anything. So you can see, you know, these stocks in here, the close minus 100 days ago in Berkshire Hathaway was, you know, $44,000 higher. Okay. But if you come down to the bottom of the list, and I'm going to go ahead and unflag everything in my system. You see how these aren't calculated? And this is, this is these type of things were str are straight from the IPO course, FYI. If you have it, it's, it's already in there, so you, could, you, could, you have a copy of this. So come down to the last, or I should say the first one that hasn't calculated, and then flag all below it. Now, this is every stock that came public over the last 100 days. And then watch list, copy to another list, flag symbols, and then just give it a name, anything you want to call. We'll call it a, 
IPO demo, whatever. IPO 100 demo. So we'll copy them over there. And then we'll go to IPO, we could find it, 100 demo right here. So 180 issues came public over the last 100 days. That's pretty crazy, huh? Hopefully that's not a canary in a coal mine. Now, I'm not going to go through a lot of details here, but one thing you could do, see this is a preferred stock here, preferred stock here, power shares. I mean, you could have the system flag all the, um, what do you call those things, ETFs, like gold dollar trust, uh, preferred stock. So you want to take all this crap out. You want to take these uh, bonds out of here, all that stuff, because that's that's irrelevant. That's not what we're going for. See all these IPOs here? I mean, I'm sorry. Um, what do you call those things? ETFs, okay? So come in here and get rid of all these ETFs. And again, you can flag all the ETFs in the system. I don't want to make it too much of a, I don't want to make it too much of a uh, lesson in TC because what I'm trying to show you is a general thinking. So we'll remove all the ones that we flagged, okay? And then if you're looking at these, a lot of them could be really thin. So you might weed out the thin ones. And volume's tricky. I spend a lot of time covering volume because there's so much to talk about. Because sometimes they just have, they can have light volume, but they still might be worth trading. So as you can see, the first one with the most amount of volume over the last 100 days is uh, Snap. And just for SNGs, we put the moving average in here. So let's look at a few of these. This is a, what do you call that? An ETF, so we ignore that. Only one day there. But you can see, like I said, a lot of them just, they fly or they die. Look at this one, came public here. And it didn't trigger a signal here because it didn't take out this, it didn't close at the new high first. And then there's also another rule, this has to be taken out too, if that's the high of the thing, okay? This is an ETF, so you'd ignore that, okay? Now, if you were trading that system, let's see, your buy would be like right here, I think, on this one. Okay, I'm not going to walk through all these, and I would suggest you do that on your own. SND, your buy was right there. Uh, this one, your buy was right here, okay? This one has uh, will give you a buy right here. This one just died, okay? Never triggered. So you can see, it's kind of a fun thing to do. This one just died, never triggered. So you got a couple of winners so far in there, and then quite a few of them have died. This one will give you a buy here. One a little, now it's going to lose a little. That's where money management comes in. This one will have a buy like right here. So play with that when you get a chance. Uh, but the main thing I want to show you here, I don't want to digress too far into the system, but the main thing I want to show you is how to set up your IPO. So you got 180-something of them which we already knocked out about 20. And then you just go through them and get rid of the ones that are just garbage. Okay, ETFs, get rid of that and everything else. Okay? Screen is frozen. That might be your screen is frozen. It shouldn't be frozen. The good news is the um, recordings are very robust. Okay? Donald says he can't. He can confirm it does work in the newer version of Telechart. Okay, fantastic. Okay. So if you have a new form of TC, dual version of TC, which I would imagine if it works in newer TC, it'll probably work in uh, something like Metastock or some other type of program where you have a, a nice big database of everything in there. Okay. If you want to be part of a company pre-IPO, you have to be connected to someone at the company and invest in typically 25K, which is not liquid, where the IPO money is made. Those investors sell their, their shares for huge gains or the dummies who buy it on day one. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Robert, good point. And that's something that I went into a lot of detail in. I don't know if you have the course or not. I don't, it's like I have to look everybody up. But uh, there's a lot of people looking to get off the hook at an IPO, pre-IPO, okay? So, and again, we don't have enough time to get into this. And, and I spent, I don't know how many hours of the course, but... Good point, though. I'm glad you brought it up, Robert. Um, so, and again, this was covered in a lot of detail, so just go in and rewatch the course. But the problem is, oops, there's two things that are happening. There's a lot of 
nuances and characteristics. But there's two things that are happening in an IPO. Pre-IPO, you have a lot of people looking to get off the hook. And that's why I, in, in my videos, I took a little clip art of a hook and put over here, okay? And then you have people who are manipulating that stock price. They're trying to put it as high up as they can, but then leave some meat on the bone so they can push it higher. Now, this is why I talk so much about the die and die, because sometimes they price it too high and then it begins to die. Okay, somebody fudged up when that happens, although the company, I guess, gets, gets the money, which is good for the company, but bad for the investor because there's no meat left on the bone. Okay, so yeah, you're right, and that's a lot of that big selling on day one that you see. And then there's holding periods and all kinds of other crazy things that happen. Okay, let's hop into the charts. Let's just take a look at the overall market real quick, and then we'll pop into uh, your individual stock questions. Everybody got how to make those do those IPOs? Because I, I received uh, at least a half a dozen emails on that over the week. And if you do have questions on anything um, like that, feel free to ask me. And in more recent times, I just haven't had enough time to, to reply personally. So in some cases, uh, we will cover it in a chart show. Okay, let's start with the S&P 500. On a micro level, let's work on a micro level and work our way back. One thing I kind of hate about markets is a lot of times on a Fed day, you have this big pop, and then next day it begins to fizzle, okay? Everybody gets all excited, and then there's nobody left to buy. So that's kind of a bit of a bummer. But let's not get into a one-bar or two bar pattern, okay? So today's action so far serves as a bit of a, a bit of a bummer. But if we back if we back the chart out a little bit, we could see that this big blue arrow obviously still remains intact. And so far, the market has begun to rally out of a bull flag. Today's action notwithstanding. So what I would encourage you to do is air or on the side of a longer term trend, if a market is at or near new all time highs, then err on the side of the longer term trend. So, you know, right here, new highs. Okay, well, it's rolling over a little bit, but you know what? I'm going to stay bullish because it's making new highs. And then it made new highs, and it made new highs. What's well, that new highs here? But let's go ahead and stay bullish as a general statement. And then there goes make new highs. And then it makes new highs again. And now it's just what? A little bit more than a half percent off of all-time highs. Now, obviously, there's no guarantee. And some of those aforementioned bears might be right. I guarantee you, though, they're not going to be right enough or call enough type tops to be a successful trader. Okay. If they call the mother of all tops, they might get put on TV. You know, well, you'd have to already be on TV for that. But let's say you're already on TV, you call the mother of all tops. You look like a hero. But in markets, it's like, now what, you know? <laughs> I was going to make an analogy to being married. And, you know, you're a hero for a while, but you will. <laughs> you do something to aggravate your wife. That I could promise for you guys. <laughs> Anyway, um, NASDAQ just off all-time high. So far, so good. It's rallying out of the pullback. Looks a little bit better than the piece, shorter term, okay? And obviously, uptrend remains intact. Nice persistent run so far remains intact there, too. Take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty is a bit of a bummer because it came back into this prior range. But then yesterday, it began to take off a little bit. Kind of, eh, just kind of sitting there today. But I sure would like to see it make new highs and not come back. But I'm not going to complain. What did I just say? Air on the side of the longer term trend when the market is at or what? Near new highs. Okay. Let's take a look at bonds real quick before I forget. Bonds got a little bit of a bounce yesterday, which is a good thing because we don't want bonds to implode just yet and we don't want them to implode fast. Um, when it comes to the bond market now, 
it's going to be the delta. In other words, a change of bonds, which is going to be a lot more scarier to the market than the relative level of interest rates in and of themselves. So what if rates go from 0 0.00001 to 0 0.00015, okay? Who cares, right? Well, the market cares if it does it really quickly because it, it puts this fear into the market. So it's good to see that bonds have stabilized and really haven't worsened much since when? December, okay? So we got three months roughly where they're pretty much flat. So that's good. So again, if we start dropping in earnest like this, let's put, let's see if we can overlay the S&P 500 real quick. Keep those questions coming. I promise to hurry up and get there. So if we put in a comparison of, uh, let's try the S&P 500. Okay. Well, that didn't work exactly as, as promised. Well, you can see, yeah, it began to implode here a little bit, and the market began to implode, you know. you got to be careful with this intermarket technical analysis. You can see they had a pretty big high correlation here. But, yeah, that's the problem with intermarket technical analysis. It only matters when it matters. When bonds were imploding back here, the market was also imploding with it, okay? And then, look, here's a good example. Bonds were taken off. No, I did Never mind. Forget that. Just the opposite. That's the problem with intermarket technical analysis. You've got to be really careful because there's long lead and lag times, and it only matters when it matters. So the good news is we don't have to worry about bonds for now because they've gone what? Mostly sideways. Now, one thing that's interesting that's happening, you take a look at the dollar. And the dollar has dropped a little bit over the last few days, okay? And it looks a little bearish, somewhat longer term, as you can see. Kind of rallied up, and now it's stalled out, rolling, rolling back over. Well, what that has done, some of these areas like the energies, which were looking a little dubious, and then even more impressive, the metals and mining, it, it gave them a bit of a push up yesterday. Now, energies look pretty dubious in here, so I wouldn't rush out and buy the energies. Unless you had the mother ball setups, and of course it triggered an entry. But take a look at the metals and mining. Speaking of commodities, they were up about six percent yesterday, or five and a half percent, whatever it was, and they had a pretty deep pullback. So they're they're looking a little bit questionable in here, but so far so good. Even though they're questionable, you don't bail out because they're looking iffy, like somebody suggested earlier. Because what there's always going to be a reason to exit a trade and rarely a reason to stay. Now, quite a few areas in here, manufacturing, not too far from brand new highs. Health services just banged out new highs just as of yesterday. Material construction stocks banging out new highs. Well, that kind of goes in line with the Trump play. Well, Dave, I thought you said don't worry about connecting the dots. Well, don't connect the dots with these big picture plays, but if they begin to play out, then by all means, play them, okay? Uh, retail is just kind of all over the place. Uh, it looks okay, somewhat shorter term, but as you can see, it's just kind of all over the place. I'd like to see new highs here before getting too excited about retail. The good news is anything technology-related, uh, most anything technology-related is looking pretty good in here. Hardware, software, as you can see, semiconductors at brand new highs, so that's certainly a good thing. And then finally, transports, we're pulling back fairly deeply, kind of looking a little sideways at best. They had a pretty decent day yesterday. It's still not too far from all-time highs. So let's just err on the side of long-term trend. Okay, not regarding IPO. So how far a pullback? What year, two year do you look at overhead supply when determining whether or not to buy a stock? Thanks, Robert. Okay, uh, again, I don't know who has what on the fly, but we spent probably, oh, I don't know, 30 minutes on that in the course on, on stock selection. So the quick answer is there is no quick answer. Um, if it's really obvious that it's just above the market and it's not that far back, a month or two, then it's very important and you should avoid a stock with overhead supply. Uh, the further back in time, the less meaningful it is, but you've got to remember that sometimes markets have very, very long memories. Now, one thing that does happen over time, unfortunately, people die. Unfortunately, people get divorced. Uh, people's kids go to school, cost them a lot of money, whatever. 
So they will sell some of that stock, into, even though it's going down, to just unload it. So that does help work the supply out, but there's no quick answer on that. Um, when you ask about individual stocks, you know, one way to get it without getting the course, I shouldn't tell you this, <laughs> is, to, is to go in and watch as many weekend charts as you can stand and watch what I say about um, overhead supply when somebody asks. Three steps, three raises in chart rates, then the stumble. Eh, yeah, be careful with those those adages, but I hear you, Howard. I'm not going to argue with you on that, that's for sure. All right, let's take a look at some of your stocks in here. Uh, Bob, we can't look at that one. That's actually a setup for today, but I'll give you a high five because that's on my list uh, in the service. Good job. And if you're on the service, don't mention anything in the lander list if you don't mind. Craig wants to know about SBLK. That sounds, that, that sounds like a shipper. Oops. Let's see if we can get this set up properly. SBLK. We're long salt, as you know. Um, it's not currently set up, but I hear what you're saying. I hear you. It's uh, approaching these multi-year highs. And here's what I like about the shippers. They've been just absolutely creamed. So I would watch this, and I would see if it could set up along the way. And then, you know, getting back to your question about overhead supply. It does have some overhead supply, but it's made such a great long, 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 long base in here that it depends on how high it gets up. I wouldn't worry about it as much because it, in order for it to set up a little bit, it would actually have to break out to new highs, and that would uh, help erase some of this overhead supply. So let it continue to break out and then play the pullback, but absolutely 1,000%. Put that on your momentum list. And then if you take a look at, like, salt, longer term, I mean, it's got some overhead supply up here, you know? Well, D, why would you buy an overhead supply? Well, it's up at 20 dollars a share. So if it goes to 20 dollars a share from these levels, I would be a very happy camper, okay? CRM is a long. Um... No, it's a little too wide and loose longer term. I hear you, though. I mean, it's 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 shaped up recently. Uh, it would have to break out and then pull back. Also, take a look at your uh, HV on that. A little bit on the low side. So let it break out the new highs and then maybe look to play pullbacks along the way. Massey. Yeah, that looks good. That looks good. Um, yeah, good looking stock. HV is a little low, but it's been very persistent. So that sort of trumps the low HV. You're getting a bit of a knockout move today. I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move, though, okay? Uh, just, to, just to make sure you cleaned out a few more people. But, yeah, that's, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. I'd like to see, a little bit, again, a little bit more knockout move. But that's almost a textbook-looking setup. If this thing would just kind of pull back. Maybe to like, uh, let's say, 87 or so. But, yeah, put that on your watch list for sure. What is historical volatility? Historical volatility is a statistical measurement on volatility. And in my case, I'm using 50 days. This is a 50-day HV. I will give you the formula if you want it for TC. If you want it for Metastock, you can just Google it because that's what I did to get it. And I think that's what I did years ago when I actually wrote those did a lot of coding in that and easy language, et cetera. Um, it's a statistical-based volatility, and I don't want to show you what little I know about statistics, but it's that bell curve thing where there's a two-thirds chance or whatever within two-thirds of the bell curve. This particular market, for instance, is going to be 17% higher or 17% lower on an annualized basis. But don't worry about all that stuff. Just like you flip a switch and get light, just know that the bigger the number, the more volatile the stock is. The smaller the number, the less volatile the stock is. If you compare it to, let's say, let's just punch up the S&P 500 cash. S&P 500 cash, or let me put Spiders. I might not have that calculated. Spiders is 7 right now. Okay. And what's the, uh, that seems kind of low. What's the NASDAQ? Where's my HV? Well, I must not have it calculated for some reason. I don't know what's going on here, but um, this is a newer computer. 
But as a general statement, you want to be much higher than the market or, or relatively higher than the overall market. It's hard to beat a market if your HV is not higher. See, the uh, Russell 2000 is a good example, HV of 14. Uh, right now, I'm finding most of my opportunities in 30s and 40s and uh, way up there, even further. In fact, I'll show you. We take a look at the portfolio. I'll show you what we have. Um, if you study beta, if you get online, do a little research on that. Beta, HV, I use HV as a measurement of beta. How volatile is the stock compared to the overall market? So this is 73, what was the Russell 14, so it's a lot more volatile. This is Kim, we're long this stock. It's 60, what's the Russell 14, so it's much more volatile. Now here's the least volatile stock in our portfolio. It's got an HV of 22, which is still significantly higher than the overall market. But it had a much higher HV when we got into it. And take a look at salt. We just looked at salt. has a, a HV of 80. Oh, one thing while we're on salt I want to show you. Did I just show you this? Yeah, I did. Uh, the reason I like these Phoenix type of stocks that have bottomed out for a long, long time is, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully it'll return to $100 a share or maybe even more. Okay? We're going to hope. Let's hope big. And that's what happens every now and then with these uh Stocks that just bottom out for years and years and years. I have SP at 6 and Comp at 7. Okay, thank you, Phil. I didn't realize they were that low. Comp's at 7, thank you. Okay. GDX from Marvo. Marvino, sorry. I wish I, I wish there was a way to make the font bigger on this uh, thing. I have to struggle a little bit. Uh, no, I'm going to avoid gold for now. It's just too wide and loose and sideways. Um, it would have to make some serious new highs before I start looking at gold again. Okay. See how it's kind of in the middle of this big longer term. This range is contained within this longer term uh, trend or whatever you want to call that. And it's no longer a trend. It's, trend. it's kind of all over the place. So I would hold off on gold for now. Oh, that's what you say, Craig. Sell to 100 from from your mouth to God's ears. Yeah, I, you know, I almost I was in the webinar on Monday, and uh, we had to uh, uh, we were asked if it's going to go higher or lower the overall market that is by Friday and give our percentage correct that we thought we had correctly predicted it. And uh, the two guys were lower, so I figured, well, wait a minute, I'm going to err on the side of longer term trend. So I said 100% correct. That'll go higher. So I'll probably just jinx the market by doing that. Arco, ARCO. Uh, maybe on pullbacks. Uh, let's see. Yeah, maybe on pullbacks. You know, my only problem here is that you've got this one massive wide range bar. I would like to see a series of accelerating bars higher. And sometimes if you get a one massive wide range bar, the stock will come right back in. So, yeah, just keep it on, you know, put it on your momentum list if you want. But I, I would, it would have to do quite a few things. IRBT for Greg. IRBT. Uh, long or short? Because this looks like a short, at least it was back here. I would leave it alone. I wouldn't go long or short this right now. But if I was forced to do something... It looks more like a short. And there's, see, there's your overhead supply right here. So this stock could get into trouble as it pushes into this overhead supply. I would just leave that one alone as a general statement. Craig says ICHR above 19. And um, sure, absolutely. Okay. Or if it pulls back a little bit, maybe. I mean, it has lost a little steam in here. So, yeah, maybe let it break out and see if it keeps on going. This would be a fun one to put that little, uh, let's put, a, just for SOGs, let's put a moving average on here. Yeah, your buy would have been right there. Okay, you see that? See, brand new closing high, low below the moving average. Okay. And then there was another setup on that day there. But yeah, absolutely. But yeah, let it break out the new highs and then on pullbacks. Put that obviously in your list. Arsini wants to know about INCY. Arsini. Uh, yeah, sure, on a pullback. Uh, let it keep on, keep on keeping on, put it on your momentum list. Um, it is beginning to accelerate higher. That's fine, okay? 
Uh, here's that just that one bar I talked about earlier, but notice that it did gap higher, kind of drifted higher, and now it's accelerating higher. So on a pullback, yeah, let's put it in a minimum list, but only on a pullback. Robert wants to know about SHLO. A lot of new faces in here. Welcome aboard, guys. Elvis, I need you to put those in one at a time, okay? I'm going to do the first one, then I'm going to delete your uh, post, then put them in one at a time if you don't mind, because otherwise I won't know who's who. Um, this looks okay. A uh, bit of a knockout bar here. This would have been your entry above this high. Kind of chopping around a little bit. I'll give that an okay. Um, pretty serious run in here. And then the other thing is it's really thin. I didn't notice how thin it was. So a little too thin to be trading. So with that caveat, let's let's say you can't don't trade it because it's too thin. But I hear you. It's not it's not bad looking, okay? Because you do have a bit of a knockout type of move in it. Yeah, I'll be sorry to sorry to, to bust your uh bust you up on that a little bit. It's just it's it's hard. I won't be able to keep up. That's for your benefit. Yeah, GMS, uh put that on your momentum list, uh Elvis. Uh but what's gonna have to happen is now I'd like to see some acceleration higher and then for pullback, but absolutely put that in your momentum list. Yeah, all right, we're good, cool. Yeah. But yeah, you can ask about as many as you want. Just hit return. Uh Brett, we can't talk about that one. That one's actually a setup for today, so good eye on that one. Uh, Donald, we can't talk about that one. That's actually a setup for today, so good eye on that one. So you guys got you have, you guys have two out of three of the setups for today, so I'm proud of you. FBK for Elvis, and we're gonna get back to your other guys too. Uh, my problem here is like it, it made this huge kind of quantum leap higher. Uh, I don't know. I think I would have to let this one break out to new highs. Also, look too thin. Okay, way too thin. The average volume is not much. So um, my general rule is 250K or more average volume over a 30-day period. But I, I will dip below that on occasion. And then in IPOs, it's tricky. So it's it's hard for me to tell you, give the exact number of IPOs. You have to kind of pick them apart and figure out if there's like volume coming in or not, which is beyond the scope of today's uh, presentation. CERU. I'm going to have to go into lightning round here, too. Uh, this is a little bit too extreme, okay? It went from one buck or whatever up to three bucks, so 300% run or 200% run, whatever it is, 300% over a short period of time. Then it's got all its trading back here. Too wide and loose and crazy. And then look at your HV, 165. Anything over 100 is going to be squirrely and tough to trade. Uh, Andre wants to know about PPHM. Uh, no, too much overhead supply. Okay, and then you got this big gap down here, so I would leave that one alone. I guess I have to go in a lightning round. B win for also for Andre. Uh, yeah, this one looks pretty good at first glance. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, thin. I know you like those thin ones though, just too thin, too thin to trade. But yeah, decent. Uh, you know, maybe had a little bit more pullback here, a little bit more knockout move, but super duper thin. Tig. Uh, no, it's a little sideways, but remember, as we said, H, uh, uh, IPOs do have a breakout characteristic. Unfortunately, it's really thin, so we'd have to kind of pick it apart. Not enough time to do that. Just for S and Gs, let's see if it triggered on the um, moving average thing. Uh, yeah, I guess it would have triggered. Oops. Hold on. Five. Let's see. Yeah, I would have triggered on this day here. Um, I mean, it looks okay. You know, like I said, IPOs have a breakout characteristic, so maybe on a breakout. I'm not a big breakout player, but there are some IPO things. Greg wants to know about GME as a short. Uh, no. Uh, I liked – we were short this one a couple years ago, like way up here or something, but um, – well, way back here. No, it's just it's just wide and loose and all over the place. If you're gonna short something, short something that's coming off of major highs. Okay, PME shippers seem to be going. PME is a food, right? PME. Yeah, I mean this one's kind of had an extreme run, but I hear you. I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move. But yeah, I've been watching that one for a while. Site S I T E for Donald. Uh, so far, you just got this one breakout bar. It's going to take some follow-through for me to get excited. Cool for Andre. I like that stock, or did like that stock. 
Um, but now it's going to, now it's, well, it's kind of thin. Eh, it's all right. Uh, it's going to have to break out the new highs. It did pull back, but it's kind of extreme and it's all over the place. But I hear you. Maybe on a breakout. P L S E also for Andre. Yeah, you know, on a pullback, maybe uh, pretty thin, though. It's one of those thin Andre stocks. I hear you, though. Absolutely. On a pullback, but again, super, super, super thin on that one, so be careful. H L N E for Mr. Howard. Good to see you, Howard. Um, well, one thing, let's see, you don't have a tremendous amount of range, but you do have a little bit of range. That's one thing that I like to see in IPOs is, is some range from when they open and, and get moving, but it's okay. So let's, just for SGs, let's put a, a moving average in there. So, yeah, if it closed... If it closes anywhere above that line there, anywhere above this close here, it would be actually be a buy today. So it's not bad. Uh, you have to check your volume, though. It looks like it could be a little thin, so be careful with that. NCR, probably not going to like it. It's just a big, fixed stock. Oh, it looks like it's in trouble, though. Yeah, I wouldn't rush out and short it. Uh, on a short side, I'm a little bit different about the one bar down uh, thing I was talking about. Uh, I think it looks like it's short, absolutely, but I'm not going to short anything. Why? Well, because the market's going up. A-A-O-I. Yeah, it looks fantastic. A um, little bit extreme in the move higher, but I hear you. I'd almost like to see a tiny bit more knockout move. Um you know, ideally, I wish I'd see a few more wide range bars in here, but it, it has accelerated higher. So, yeah, I think it looks okay. IMOS. You know, keep in mind that because the market hasn't pulled back much, we're not getting enough pullbacks. No, uh, I would avoid this one until it could uh, do a serious breakout, okay? It's going too much sideways. Notice your first day of trading set the high. Go in and watch last week's. Um, webinar about IPOs and if you don't uh, and if you have it watch the uh, IPO course BBIV that's going to be thin probably yeah too thin but I hear you it's it's in a trend yeah watch for a pullback absolutely AKAO for Brett did we talk about that one I'm gonna have to wrap things up in a second yeah that looks okay um you know, there's a case where you had that one big bar. I'm not crazy about that, but it looks okay. And it's it's had quite the trend longer term. I'd almost like to see a little bit more knockout, but it's not bad. I, I would definitely put that on your watch list. ASIX. ASIX. No, it's too, far, it's too sideways, okay? So that's going sideways since, what, January? Leave that alone for now. But let it break out to new highs, and then maybe it might be worth trading on a pullback. AMAT on a pullback. Uh, sure, absolutely. You've got a nice uh, persistent uptrend. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Put that on your watch list. Sure. TTD for Jim. Uh, a little bit more pullback, maybe. Uh, this one is on my watch list, but yeah, a little bit more pullback. That's an IPO. And it's you probably had a buy signal and a breakout pattern here on that. Again, not a fan of breakouts, but in IPOs, it can work nicely. AEHR. Also for Jim. Yeah, I think we talked about that one. Maybe on a pullback. It needs to be a little bit deeper. Uh, a little thin, but not too thin. And kind of squirrely. I think as a general statement, I pass on that one. HV is 105. It's kind of squirrely. I hear you, though. It's kind of gotten its act together. Maybe if it pulls back a little bit more. MPL. Yeah, we'd have to go ahead and wrap things up, probably. MPL. Oops. I don't know what's going on there. All right, let's just get a couple more in. GV. No, HGV. Uh, this was a little tricky because it did pull back to where it kind of broke out from. So what happens with IPOs is there's kind of the pioneer type of patterns where you'd look to get in early on, like with that moving average pattern I showed, but then there are secondary patterns. So once they're out for so long, then at some point you're being treated them like a secondary, 
type of setup like you would, in other words, like a normal setup. So in a case like this, I think because it pulled all the way back to where it broke out to, I would wait for it to get to new highs and then look to play pullbacks along the way, just like you would with a generic type of setup. The good news is if it does get to new highs, then you're not going to have any overhead resistance to deal with. Well, look, you know, I know I didn't get to everyone. Um, my apologies, but uh, anything unanswered um, as far as not individual issues, it's just not enough time to get to everyone uh, on that. But uh, anything question-wise unanswered, shoot me an email. If there's not time to cover it via email, then uh, I promise you I'll get to it uh, in next week's uh, webinar. Anyway, uh, everybody have a fantastic uh, weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, I can't thank you guys and girls for coming enough. So thank you so much. Uh, again, this is, as I often say, this is the highlight of my week. So thank you guys and girls. And then hopefully we'll see everybody again uh, next week. Thank you so much.